Okay, hey, let's uh, take your seats and we can get started. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, today's I4 Energy Center seminar. Um, also want to welcome those that are visiting us uh, on, on the Internet. My name is Gamey. I'm the technical director of the I4 Energy Center. And before I get started, uh, Jason Traeger has got another announcement. Hey, what's up, everyone? Uh, I just want to thank uh, three more people for signing our sustainability pledge. Uh, Dominic Malinari, Mal Marilyn Kushner, and Paul Cosman. So, go sustainability. Great. Thanks, Jason. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Elliot Campbell. He's an uh, assistant professor at UC Merced with appointments in the Sierra Nevada Research Institute in the School of Engineering. Uh, professor Campbell works in the area of ecological engineering with a focus on agroecosystem sustainability for food and biofuel production. Uh, he has consulted on state, federal, and international policy and has appeared in media ranging from NPR's Morning Edition to The Economist. He received his uh, BS and MS from Stanford, that other school, PhD from the University of Iowa, and, the, and then completed a postdoc at the Carnegie Institution for Science. Welcome, Elliot. All right, thanks. So, um, uh, I did spend some time across the bay, but I also grew up going to Cal Camp, so I feel very at home uh, here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, bioenergy sustainability, and there's a lot of great work, especially at Berkeley, going um, on on this topic. That The approach that my group takes, though, is a very large-scale approach. So we apply environmental systems models, particularly atmospheric models, land surface models, land use models, these types of things. To, um, to questions about bioenergy sustainability. And we always couple this with uh, an integrated life cycle assessment to look at these uh, potential environmental impacts from the full life cycle phases of biofuels production. This picture here is of a DC-8. Um, in this case, there's no biodiesel in this plane. Uh, Gaiman and I were talking about it a minute ago. It's, uh, um, it does have a very interesting payload. It's not peanuts and... Uh, sodas, it's um, a lot of scientists and instrumentation for making atmospheric chemistry and physics measurements. And I'll be talking uh, towards the end of the talk about how the measurements you can get from this aircraft can be very informative for uh, answering questions about biofuel sustainability at very large scales. So the, let's see. All right. There we go. Okay, so one of the uh, interesting things about biofuels is it's an incredibly contentious topic. You might be familiar with Steven Snyder's book, uh, Science is a Contact Sport. Um, and if you were going to write a sequel, uh, Bioenergy Science is a Contact Sport might be a good one because people will get red in the face talking about this stuff. Um, and there's four important issues that are really central to the debate, uh, economics, energy security, climate and water. Uh, so on the economic side, it's real two uh, uh, arguments you can make here. It can be a huge advantage to rural economies. You can produce jobs um, and, and bring a lot, a lot of money to parts of uh, our economy that might be somewhat neglected. At the same time, um, if you produce biofuels in a way that um, uses arable land, um, you're competing for resources that are uh, uh, important to the global food system. You raise the price of basic food commodities, and that's a threat to people who are um, food insecure. So right now, about a billion people in the world um, are, are faced with this challenge, and, and this could be exacerbated if you dedicate a lot of uh, our arable lands to producing energy instead of food. Energy security also can go both ways. So the Venezuelan... Uh, um, mural on the left probably needs no translation. There's a lot of people that are extremely concerned about um, importing petroleum for reasons of political importance uh, from nations with um, in, uh, uh, politics that they might not agree with, um, but also because of the price volatility. Um, at the same time, the way you develop biofuels um, might threaten energy security in other parts of the world. So this is a picture of a person walking past a generator in Honduras, there's 
Um, uh, a big problem with energy poverty in the world too, where people um, are looking um, uh, for developing rural electrification, these types of things. And biomass, when you take your first look at it, it seems like a, a good resource for that kind of concern. It's very dispersed across the planet. Um, but there's a, a, a move towards a trade regime where the biomass that can be cheaply produced in um, tropical developing nations is essentially um, exported to the developing world. So, so there could be um, um, some challenges to the, um, meeting these problems of, uh, of developing energy in developing countries. Climate is the uh, issue that people are most familiar with. On the left, uh, there's a, you know, filling up your tank with an ethanol blend has a direct substitution effect for p petroleum. So there's probably a, a climate benefit from, uh, from that aspect. But uh, there are ways to produce biofuels in ways that lead to tropical deforestation. And some people argue that, that you can even do that within the United States based on what type of land you use. If you, again, if you use these prime food production lands, you are uh, integrating the bioenergy system with the global food production system, and that can contribute to deforestation to the extent that the biofuels that are replacing the fossil fuels could have an either a bigger greenhouse gas uh, impact than the fossil fuels they replace. So a very contentious issue. The last issue is water. There's a lot of really interesting ideas about how to produce biofuels, such as this buffer strip here that protects the waterway from sediment and uh, nutrient, uh, other chemical runoff that um, is a big problem. So you could harvest this in a way that uh, still maintains this sort of um, uh, protective uh, function for our water, our water resources. Um, on the right, though, is a picture of our major problem, uh, the hypoxic zone. And if you are expanding the agriculture system, um, and, and many of these candidate biofuel crops will require uh, some level of fertilization and land management, and that could further exacerbate the hypoxic zone. So big issues, big contentious issues here, uh, a lot of argument, but nevertheless, we are moving forward. And it's because there's a lot of good reasons to be invested in bioenergy. Um, some of those that I like the most are at the bottom of this list. There's um, important synergies with fossil fuels, which means this could be a relatively near-term solution, not something that, that's implemented way down the line. There's synergies with other renewables, um, the intermittency of uh, uh, biofuels is on a very different scale than the intermittency of other renewables, so there's a, a nice um, opportunity to take advantages of these different temporal uh, characteristics of uh, biofuels, PV, wind, these sorts of things. The last bulleted point here uh, is that it's perhaps better to ask how. So why is a, is, is a good theoretical question, but um, if we are moving forward with biofuels, which it looks like we're doing, it, it may be best to get involved and, and try and say what is, uh, try and determine what the most sustainable trajectory for biofuels would be. So on the how issue, we, we know we're moving forward um, in one sense because we have government mandates around the world that uh, are, are making sure that there's ever-growing amounts of biofuel production. So this is what we have in the U.S. Uh, you can see that from uh, 2008 out to 2022, we have some really ambitious growth um, targeted for our fuel system here. Um, the interesting thing about this policy is shown in the insert, the white insert here. Um, you can see that there's life cycle greenhouse, greenhouse gas thresholds specified for these different categories of fuels. And this, to my knowledge, is the first uh, implementation of a greenhouse gas regulation on a major industry in the U.S. So that's pretty exciting. If you're interested in climate change and the impacts of different technologies, here's one where all of a sudden it really does matter because this, there's a law behind it. So that's liquid biofuels, but we also make electricity from biomass. And you can see from this um, Department of Energy uh, summary for U.S. production that this pink category in 2008, that's the biomass that's used to pr produce electricity, it is on the same scale as, as some of these other renewables that we think about most often when we think about electricity, like um, wind, solar, geothermal. And, you know, take this projection with a grain of salt, but nevertheless, here it is. You can see what the DOE expects we might have in 2035. And as you can see, biomass electricity is a big part of, uh, big part of the portfolio. So really um, 
Uh, maybe this how question might be more important than why. There's uh, an incredible amount of funding uh, available for not just um, more typical areas of biofuels research, say from plant biology or chemical engineering, but really interdisciplinary work. Um, so uh, now is a good time to, um, to get involved for that reason as well. Okay, so that's the big overview. I want to talk a little bit about some of the activities in my group that tends to support um, answering questions about biofuel sustainability, and I'll focus on three important areas, the land availability, um, how we characterize the impacts of biofuels on greenhouse gases, and uh, energy security, and so on, and then finally, the biomass yields, and I'll probably spend the most time on the biomass yields to kind of go over some of the methods and, and the, um, the most recent results from our group. Uh, and lastly, I'll, I'll take a step back to talk about some of the uh, uh, impacts on society from this uh, research and, and teaching in biofuels. Okay, so the land question. Um, the land question is a huge issue. There's some really um, uh, highly cited papers that came out in 2008 describing problems with using the wrong land resource for biofuels, but um, maybe one of my favorite publications, The Onion, commented on it as well. Here we have the tattoo artist asking just once, why can't our, our poorly considered quick fixes work? And our group is, uh, empathizes with the tattoo artist. We don't want her to stay up late at night worrying about this. So we've been working on identifying land resources that won't contribute to uh, problems with biofuels. And one possibility is abandoned agriculture lands that are um, shown in these series of maps here. Um, on the left two panels are two different estimates of um, abandoned cropland. On the right is what happens when you consider pastures and put everything together. But the idea here is that their agriculture lands that at least at one point were seemed economically uh, viable for producing, um, they aren't used for that purpose anymore, so they're not contributing at least to the current um, food system, but perhaps they could contribute to biofuels production. The upper left panel, you see the U.S. really shows up brightly where our um, agriculture shifted from a big eastern to a midwestern focus, and certainly there's a lot of that land that's gone either into urban or into forests where, again, you would have problems with doing biofuels in those situations. But we've filtered out those areas and found that the global resource here, just from this slice of uh, land, would be on the order of about 10% of primary energy needs. So it is scalable to do this in a, in a major way, um, even if you limit yourself to a, a relatively narrow domain of uh, Land use. What's that? Oh, the colors are missing. Well, um, if if you see no color, that means there's no land available in that area. So it's just little maybe spots of area. That's so the eastern U.S. You see the blues and the yellows and greens there, at least in that upper left plot, and that points towards the highest concentration of area, at least from that data set. That's a good point. So, um, we've repeated this analysis for the U.S. with uh, high-resolution data that's actually more relevant to policy questions, like where might you site the uh, site these uh, refineries and so on. Um, again, it's the eastern U.S. that shows up. But the difference, the surprising thing that came out of this analysis, is that overall areas are a bit, quite a bit larger, on the order of uh, 20 to 30 percent, based on um, what assumptions you make. And the areas were larger because you get these kind of aggregation areas when you lose, use these global, larger global uh, and coarser global inventories. Um, we've also applied um, these maps to regional case studies where we actually have um, measurements from the soils, kind of the background conditions. We've gone into the forest to make some soil measurements and, and also yields. So um, a group at the University of Kentucky has been growing switchgrass, miscanthus, and other candidate crops for biofuels to see how much you might actually get on these marginal lands. Um, and again, we came out, at least for this regional case study, that maybe on the order of 10% of energy, at least in this state, could be made, met with these um, degraded lands. Another piece we added in here was um, degraded mine lands in addition to the uh, abandoned agriculture lands. The last thing that um, a, a few students in the group have been working on is um, bioenergy without land. And the idea here is to um, float bags of algae out in the ocean so you don't compete with food uh, crops in that way. Um, 
and you get some other benefits as well. So Jonathan Trent is a PI at NASA Ames who's been developing this approach where these bags, um, uh, well, the, the uh, algae being cultivated in them is with fresh water, so you take advantage of forward osmosis for dewatering some of the algae. Um, the two students involved, Patrick um, Wiley and Brandy McEwen, um, they wrote a recent review paper that um, pointed to the CO2 inputs that these algae systems need and the harvesting approach, so how you dewater them, are really critical in determining whether this algae biofuel will or will not meet these EPA uh, thresholds for net greenhouse gas emissions. So that's where a lot of their energy is being spent. So the land summary is that um, a global land use uh, potential solution is focusing on abandoned agriculture lands. At the regional scale, um, you might add degrade, other types of degraded lands where, it, where they're um, available. So um, in Kentucky, it was um, mine lands. Um, but in both cases, we saw it roughly the same order of magnitude of this resource, maybe about 10% of energy needs. The next steps are um, some applications with miscanthus. There's some people that are developing these spatially explicit models for seeing what production could be across the U.S., and we'd like to apply them to these maps. Um, also coupling these maps with um, uh, constraints related to uh, carbon capture and sequestration. There is a growing concern that um, we may need to turn the clock backwards with the atmospheric CO2. And one way to do that, one way to actually reduce atmospheric concentrations might be to combine uh, biomass energy production with CCS. Um, but no one's really thought about, well, where do you produce it and where the, uh, what are the constraints from the CCS side of things? And then lastly, we'll be working more on offshore algae without, um, in the next few years. Okay, so that was the land resource. We also do a lot of work to characterize the impacts. Um, with life cycle assessment in particular. So um, one question we asked was, how many miles per acre does your car get? Um, and in this case, the plot is showing uh, transportation miles produced. So if you had a hectare of uh, biomass crop and, and, and you harvest it, how many thousands of miles could you go in a given year? And the two plots are comparing two possible approaches. One is where you convert that biomass into ethanol for an internal combustion engine vehicle. The right plot is if you took the equivalent amount of biomass and made electricity to power a battery electric vehicle. And the net result shown in black that accounts for these inputs and the gross outputs is that um, over a wide range of assumptions, it's about an 80% benefit for going the electricity route. Uh, and the, most of the assumptions in this analysis are very conservative, so this suggests that there may be some um, real positive reasons for thinking about biomass for electricity in addition to biomass for liquid transportation fuels. So this is some more recent work as well where we're comparing uh, energy security concerns with climate change concerns. And there are quite a few people now that you might ask about biofuels who could be skeptical about the impacts of climate change and say, you know, whether or not this particular approach to biofuels contributes to greenhouse gas emissions is irrelevant um, because I'm really in this business for energy security concerns to reduce petroleum imports. And I think that they're missing something here because there really is a tight connection between these two. If you move from petroleum to biofuels, the argument that these results are trying to um, point to is that you might be moving from a system of, say, political volatility to a system of climate volatility. So what's shown in these two plots is the uh, sensitivity of crop yields in Illinois, in this case, to climate variability. So historical plot from 1980 to 2005 is on the left, and you can see these swings where you have years of favorable versus non-favorable weather. The right plot shows what happens under a really moderate rate of CO2 emissions increases by the year, for the years 2040 to 2065, and what happens is you get uh, more intense fluctuations in temperature and precipitation extremes that lead to more intense fluctuations in the biomass that you're producing on these lands. Um, so the, again, the concern is that energy security and climate change might not be two totally distinct issues. Even if you're really not concerned with climate change issues like sea level rise and so on, there is uh, uh, there does appear to be a strong connection between the volatility of your biofuels production and how much greenhouse gases uh, there are in the atmosphere. 
Okay, so that was mostly focused on the U.S., but Brazil is also a very important area for thinking about uh, liquid biofuels in particular. Um, not, they're not so concerned about uh, uh, liquid uh, fuels for domestic consumption. You can see their production is very high relative to their consumption, at least compared to the U.S. But if you look at the bottom plot here, you can see that their electricity is almost entirely dominated by hydroelectricity. So they'd really like to uh, diversify that. Um, one possible route to diversifying that resource is through the sugarcane lands that are there. Over half of the sugarcane uh, uh, crop is currently burned before it's harvested for a variety of reasons. And although there's a lot of interest in reducing that burning practice in Brazil, uh, what we're seeing from satellite measurements is that it's continuing um, at near uh, historic rates. Anyhow, the idea here is that if you were able to um, convince most of the farmers to stop burning the lands and just use mechanical harvesting to get this crop, the leaves and stems that are uh, that had been burnt previously and now are available could be used to produce electricity. Um, one question we asked was how much would that impact the uh, domestic uh, electricity production? Um, at the same time, people are already beginning to argue that once cellulosic ethanol technology comes online that you could actually just take those leaves and grasses, make ethanol and export that to uh, the developed world. Um, it turns out that you can have a relatively small impact on, say, the U.S. Uh, uh, consumption of, a, uh, of liquid fuels through the export of that extra biomass now converted to ethanol, but a really huge impact on the diversification of electricity production in Brazil. It looks like there's greenhouse gas advantages as well. The next step um, that we're taking with this work is combining atmospheric modeling with maps of population and different uh, health indicators to see what are the, uh, the, the health impacts from this up, upstream uh, burning practice. So we already have a lot of good information on, say, tailpipe emissions for different types of fuels. Mark Jacobson has done some work in this area. But what's new here is really looking at this really important upstream consequence. And so this is likely to have um, impacts on, on human health that have been overlooked. It may also have impacts on climate. So here we're, is a back of the envelope uh, calculation of climate forcing. Um, the first bar is showing you that I think around 94 grams of CO2 equivalents per megajoule of gasoline um, are emitted to the atmosphere. And so if you want to be an advanced biofuel, you have to reduce that greenhouse gas emission to this green dotted line here. Right now, the second colored bar over here next to the gray one is, is showing you the, this typical conventional wisdom for what, uh, what sugarcane ethanol can achieve. But if you add the black carbon component to the emissions from the refinery, from these fields, you can see that under uh, different assumptions about their climate impacts that you might exceed that threshold. So what you really want to do is use a, a coupled um, atmospheric and meteorological model to quantify these things. And there's a student in the group that's working on that. So the summary here on the impacts is that a biomass constrained life cycle assessment, so if you go on a per area or per unit biomass production, uh, points to some really startling advantages for electricity that make it uh, uh, probably a, uh, an attractive uh, path for biomass in addition to liquid fuels. Energy security and climate performance are more closely related than previously thought, and this emerging trade regime for biofuels exports from tropical developing countries presents some new challenges for energy security. So the next steps here to finish this climate forcing and health impacts analysis of the open burning in Brazil. Um, we're also putting in a proposal for airborne measurement campaign to go out and see if these models really are um, telling us anything about what's really happening. And then um, for this economic, uh, for this volatility of biomass production analysis that's coupled to a range of climate change models, we really want to know, in addition to the biomass volatility, what's the economic volatility? So we're working with some, um, some economists at Missouri that can do that kind of work. So the last issue, besides lands and impacts, are yields. What are the biomass yields? And right now, people are pretty good at doing this at a small scale. So 
the picture on the top here is David Tillman's plots in Minnesota, these mixed prairie uh, approaches to producing biomass that have very low inputs. The bottom plot is, is showing some of the work that's done um, by EBI, but in Illinois um, with switchgrass and miscanthus. So you grow these things, and then you take a large-scale model uh, and, and you parameterize that based on what you saw, say, at these plots. Um, and that's a good approach for getting started, but you, what you would really like to do is make sure that these large-scale crop or terrestrial ecosystem models that are going to predict biomass at a regional scale or global scale going beyond the plots to see if those are validated for biomass production. And we don't have a good way to do that right now. Um, our group's trying to introduce a new approach, which is to work with an atmospheric gas called carbonyl sulfide, or carbon, oxygen, and sulfur. It's at background levels at about 500 parts per trillion in the atmosphere. And as you can see from this diagram, unlike CO2, which has this two-way exchange with uh, ecosystems, carbonyl sulfide is um, basically on a one-way trip. It's irreversibly hydrolyzed by enzymes and plants and, and leaves in a process parallel to photosynthesis. Uh, so it provides a pretty good tracer of photosynthesis and biomass production. So we've done some work on this at a regional scale where we've taken what's shown in black as regional, um, ultimately atmospheric uh, chemical transport models at a regional scale, compared these um, results for the concentrations that come out of that model with the observations from various monitoring programs at NOAA or intensive air campaigns from NASA, and, and then use that to try and infer what the, what the actual uptake of carbonyl sulfide is. And again, this is closely related to biomass production, so this would be a way to actually validate these models at a large scale. And so some of this work was for North America. You can see the domain here in the blue shading is the rates of uptake of carbonyl sulfide. The red lines are the, um, where the aircraft was flying. Um, and the results look like this. There's a lot of different sources and sinks of carbonyl sulfide besides plant uptake. Um, but if you look at these darker gray shaded bars, the heights of the bars represents the tropospheric drawdown, so the difference between the, the uh, upper part of the troposphere and near the Earth's surface. So near the Earth's surface in the summer, the plants are voraciously growing, so they're ripping the carbonyl sulfide out of the atmosphere, and that's this big first bar of about uh, 60 or so parts per trillion of drawdown. You can see these other dark gray bars here are indicating the other sources of sinks, such as anthropogenic emissions from fossil fuel plants, uh, these types of things, and they're all relatively small, which again is suggesting that this might be a pretty good tracer. And then the inversion approach, the approach where we look at the concentrations that the atmospheric model produces and the concentrations that are measured from airplanes, from towers, these types of things is illustrated here. The model error for COS and CO2 for one particular fl flight is shown in this left plot. And you can see that the COS and CO2 error agree for these two peaks, um, the, 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 the second and third of these peaks, the big errors occur when the plane flies low and gets near the Earth's surface, but not the first peak, which means that there is definitely an effect on the CO2 error from both respiration and photosynthesis, but carbonyl sulfide doesn't have that same problem. The footprint of the measurements is shown in this right plot. So basically that's the upstream influence region for these atmospheric measurements that were made. And the correction to the model is pretty good. So the last plot here on the lower right is in black, the measurements. Uh, in, in orange is, is what the initial model considered the atmospheric concentration should be during this particular flight. Um, and in purple is these optimized results. So it, it does seem to work. Now going to a global scale, there's, there might be big opportunities to think about long-term trends, uh, temporal trends, instead of regional spatial trends in uh, photosynthesis and biomass production. So these plots here illustrate how uncertain uh, the long-term trends are. Uh, in this case, from 1850 to 2000, you can see four different coupled climate carbon models have really different ideas about how much uh, uh, photosynthesis is going on globally and how quickly that's changing. Um, a lot of this difference in assumptions about how quickly that's changing is due to different ideas about CO2 fertilization, but there's other factors as well. Um, there's been a lot of work to characterize CO2 fertilization. Um, in this case, this forest has uh, enhanced levels of atmospheric CO2 released to try and simulate a future world's atmosphere. 
and then the trees and, and the ecosystems overall are looked at really carefully to see if biomass production was stimulated, what other impacts did this have on the ecosystem. This work is, is, is fantastic. These are large scale experiments that are exciting, but they're small scale relative to the problem that we're interested in, which is continental or global scale biomass production. So we're limited to relatively small spatial and temporal scales here. Um, also, there's been a wide range of results from these experiments, so there's really no consensus on, on the long-term historical trends or where we're headed in the future. And it's really important for biomass. So some of these plots I showed you with these aggressive rates of growth of biomass production or photosynthesis in time, those are competitive with what people will argue are relatively optimistic scenarios of improved yields just from better management or better species uh, uh, selections. So again, this is, this is important for understanding the future of biomass production. There is a long-term historical record of carbonyl sulfide that goes back 2,000 years that Eric Saltzman at UC Irvine and Steve Monska at NOAA have been putting together. So this shows part of the record um, for ice core, fern, and now flask samples. And you can see there's this big post-industrial increase. And while a lot of work has gone into making these measurements, there hasn't been a lot of work to interpret them, um, perhaps because the, um, the, the, some initial analyses have suggested that you know this is probably an anthropogenic source. We know we get carbonyl sulfide from coal-fired power plants, um, rayon production, uh, petroleum refinery, and a, a range of anthropogenic activities. So that might be what's happening here. Um, what I've uh, done, just to take a first look at this historical record, um, is to create a model that has the ocean uh, source, the biomass burning source, the anthropogenic sources, and, and three of the largest sinks, which are this plant uptake, uh, consumption in the atmosphere um, by atmospheric reactions and an uptake by the soils. Um, so uh, a fairly simple model here, but since the inputs are so uncertain, one nice thing about a simple model is you can really explore the uncertainty of this model. And that's um, what I've been working on most recently, and the results are shown here for two different scenarios. Um, uh, on the left is if we say there's no increase historically in photosynthesis and biomass production. The plants just haven't really responded to uh, global change. And what you see here, is, so the red is uh, um, uh, Monte Carlo simulations with this box model for ra um, just randomly picking from the range of possible inputs. And the, uh, the observations are in black. And one of the problems with this um, fixed GPP scenario is that the, um, we largely overestimate the concentrations, especially uh, uh, towards the end of the period. On the right is uh, uh, model results shown for uh, a case where we allow GPP to grow at about an intermediate level uh, compared to those plots I showed earlier about what these different um, carbon climate models predict, uh, predict. And you can see that there is quite a bit better agreement. So there's about a 40% or 30% reduction in root mean square error between these, uh, between the fixed case where photosynthesis doesn't increase and the, and the case where we assume that there is some growth. If you look over a broader range of model predictions, not just at that one, but um, from a study called uh, C4 MIP that um, quite a few people at Berkeley participated in as well, you can see that the, the top plot here, um, the y-axis is the root mean square error reduction. So how much better does the model get when you allow GPP to grow according to different rates? The different rates are the x-axis. So you can see that these different C4 MIP models assume that there was a growth in global biomass production somewhere between 5% to 30%, at least from 1850 to the present. And the models that performed the best in this gray shaded region where the C4 and MIP models were um, uh, performing, uh, the models performing best are at this intermediate to high range. The models that perform the worst really are at this low, kind of flat, no GPP growth. So this provides some evidence that there may be a large historical growth in, in photosynthesis, and perhaps that's consistent with continued growth in the future, though that's hard to say. Okay, so the yield summary here is that we've got carbonyl sulfide perhaps to fill some critical gaps with upscaling our estimates of biomass production and potential biomass yields regionally and globally. The long-term trend uh, suggests that maybe there has been a historical stimulus in, in biomass production. And if that is maintained into the future, again, that could be um, 
at some of the same, uh, at least on the same order of these rates of growth you might expect from better management. The next steps are to um, uh, a range of things, but one thing we're doing is um, collaborating with Joe Barry at the Carnegie Institution who has a tunable diode laser now that can for the first time measure carbonyl sulfide at frequencies that might be appropriate for doing um, small scale micrometeorological flux measurements in the field. And um, we're going out to a DOE site with Margaret Torn, but we're also talking about applications um, with Miscanthus with the group at Illinois. Um, we're working with NOAA on inverse analysis for these uh, regional studies that's ongoing. Um, the same modeling framework could be applied to an inverse analysis for a range of energy tracers, which is something we're beginning to think about, especially for um, concerns about natural gas leakage for different types of production. And then the last bullet here is that there are some people that have talked about using carbonyl sulfide as the solution for climate problems. So this geoengineering idea to modify the atmosphere. And uh, no one's really accounted for the role that plants might play in that. So there's um, a couple issues that you might want to be concerned with. One, the plant uptake is much, much larger than what we previously thought it was. So the effort to release carbonyl sulfide might also have to be much larger. And another interesting piece of information that just came out last year from uh, Dan Yukir at the Wiseman Institute is that really high levels of carbonyl sulfide can have huge impacts on stomatal conductance. So the ability of plants to regulate how much CO2 they take up versus how much water they release. So there are some important issues here that you might want to look at um, with from a terrestrial e ecology perspective on what would happen if you put a lot of carbonyl sulfide in the troposphere. All right, I think we have a little time left here for uh, this last section. So um, that's kind of the research side of things, but we also try and make sure that this has a positive impact on society um, right now. So one of the things we do is um, a service learning program. And uh, these are some students I've worked with that have suggested um, to a nonprofit, Kiva.org, that was the client in this case, that they look towards um, going beyond the microfinance lending that they do now and also consider a, uh, in this case, it's a, um, they called it a, a weather-based, um, a weather-indexed microinsurance uh, program. So basically, the uh, farmers can get paid off if they have, uh, you know, inclement weather. And it makes insurance, or at least crop insurance, at a very small scale in rural developing areas um, feasible, where right now it's just impractical. Um, the link to biofuels is that some people are saying that there isn't enough land for biofuels in meeting future energy demand. Maybe one way around this is to boost yields in developing countries to make room for more biomass production and more food production, because right now there really is this huge gap between uh, developed world and developing world yields of uh, crops. Um, worked at Stanford on an appropriate technology class with some staff there where we had students building UV-powered uh, um, uh, water treatment systems, uh, different types of wheelchairs, so um, trying to get um, a technology that's applied to really pressing needs right now. Um, the US EPA has a great program called the P3 program that supports students to um, do small sustainability projects. In this case, we did an exchange of students between Chile and Mexico to come to the US and sent some of our students there too to be trained in uh, building energy technologies. Um, AmeriCorps has a great program now. I'm mentoring a student group at Merced that is uh, teamed up with AmeriCorps um, to do uh, outreach in the community. So education on energy efficiency, but also weatherization projects. In this case, it was in our, our local homeless shelter. Um, and um, another student group I mentor is Engineers for a Sustainable World. Um, recently, Brandy McEwen, a student there, teamed up with uh, Sun Edison to travel around rural India. Um, get a sense of what the energy uses were there. So in this case, we see some diesel pumps providing uh, a diesel generator, a diesel fired pumps basically. And the alternative she's considering, one of them is sketched up here, which would be um, using electricity um, a, as a source for the irrigation. Our dean's also heavily involved in this project too, really um, making this Sun Edison project work. And he's the um, the chair of the board of engineers for a uh, sustainable world. So. Um, we've been real lucky to have him in that regard. What Brandy's been doing is looking at the cost of some of these alternatives to the diesel, and you can see in the case of PV plus biogas and the biogas generator that things might be economically favorable. 
we've been involved in um, supporting the EPA with their renewable fuel standard, on, uh, specifically on land use issues, um, and working with uh, people to, uh, that are much better than I am than illustrating these results to a broad audience, in this case, um, a graphic artist at um, the Associated Press drew this picture that compared um, ethanol to bioelectricity from one of the papers we wrote, and uh, it led to a lot of great uh, coverage, so I think pretty good broad impacts here. And the most recent was a, a story in The uh, Economist that started out by talking about liquid fuels, but then added at the end that there is this other option, and it might have some important applications. Uh, the big summary is we have a rapid growth of biofuels with or without sustainability, so now really is the time to get involved. Luckily, there are intellectual and financial resources that could um, make involvement meaningful. There are some interesting win-win solutions. So in this one case, we talked about how uh, the energy security concerns might be really closely linked to climate change concerns. So maybe these two different camps could be um, working together instead of against each other. We're moving towards top-down constraints on photosynthesis, on biomass production, using atmospheric models. Um, lots of innovations are needed from all different types of uh, groups with different expertise. And there's certainly lots of opportunities to engage with policy, with mass media now here, so the impacts can, can be more immediate. And with that, I'll end. Thanks so much for coming to the seminar today. Thank you. So, we have uh, Nisha, there's a question in the back. How much arable or farmland is it versus the abandoned land? How many millions of acres versus what you're looking at for the abandoned land? That, that's a good question. So I have a reason for asking that. Yeah, so it's, it's relatively small. I'm trying to remember the number. So 400 million hectares, I think, was roughly the global so base, estimate. So basically about 10% or less, maybe, at the most you can get of, of, of unused land to, to grow you know, switchgrass or whatever on is what you're telling me, basically. It's, it's a relatively small fraction. Right. So why is everybody wasting so much time on that when, if you've ever spent any time on the farms in the Midwest and you watch how efficient they are and the corn stover that's coming out, based on what Berkeley tells me, 50% of it is not needed to be put back in the ground. How come you're not going after that and that 50% of the stuff that's coming out of the combine is not putting that right into cellulose ethanol and you know, getting that to go because you're not going to get the farmers to switch from corn to all these exotic, you know, switch glasses or you know, other crops. Yeah, that's a great question. So crop residues are a really important re resource for biomass. Um, the DOE's billion-ton vision that was recently updated certainly looks at that at forests, um, at urban residues, and then this category of cropland dedicated for biomass production is in there too. Um, I think all those components could play a role. The one that I'm doing the most work on is the dedicated croplands for biomass, but certainly agriculture residues could play an important role. There's a huge uncertainty there in the impacts on the soils. I don't think that's well resolved at all. In fact, I think in the last few years, people have pointed towards greater uncertainty than was previously thought. So maybe that's one of the challenges there that, that I would like to see more work done on, but I think you're absolutely right that ag residue is a, a crucial piece to this feedstock question that we're faced with. Hi, thanks. Uh, nice, nice talk. I want to maybe pick up on that kind of question, but a little more specific and locally. Um, <clears throat> so, a uh, nice report recently from the California Council on Science and Technology about how do we get to 2050. Mm -hmm. and, and sort of underlying to that was clear that uh, a lot of pilots had been stood up in California to um, essentially generate electricity out of biomass. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it crop residue under the assumption that that feedstock was a waste product. And apparently large fraction, most of those are sitting idle because once it started to kick in, then the feedstock was no longer a zero cost waste product. People wanted to be paid for it. And, you would have thought that that would settle out to some equilibrium and we would have found the appropriate price rather than shutting all these things down. Do you have any, do you know about this? Do you have any insights into well, why we didn't reach a more reasonable point where we're using this stuff? Yeah, that's a good, good point. I, I don't know a, a ton about the California biomass production for electricity, but my understanding was that it was as much about the feedstock reliability 
is about the air quality impacts. Um, maybe that's not the case, but it certainly would be in the future if you wanted to expand it to something that was big in California. So the reliability of feedstocks is a big question, um, especially when you're getting electricity that's coupled to some industry that might fluctuate, like um, for wood. But, uh, but um, air quality would be a big concern in California that I would put right up there, um, too. Um, but yeah, I am aware that these things are sitting idle now. That's, that's not very promising. So some of the electricity that you can imagine being produced is from, uh, is from the uh, 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 small power plants like these that you're talking about in California. But a lot of the electricity could also come from just a coupling with the liquid fuels production. So right now, the idea for cellulosic ethanol is that you produce a lot of liquid fuels and a small amount of electricity. Um, with sugarcane, it's a little different. It could be a lot of liquid fuels and maybe a lot of electricity too. But where you find that balance, I mean, you can tweak the system to where it's most appropriate. And you might want to alter this balance of liquid fuels production to uh, electricity to production if there are some important benefits. So this report you just referred to, one of the things that it pointed out was to meet these target reductions for greenhouse gas emissions that biomass electricity plus CCS might be needed to play an important role there. So that could be one scenario under which you might want to tweak the balance of how much liquid fuels you produce at a refinery relative to how much electricity you produce. Yeah, so the, I, what I'm interested in there is just the uh, land use constraint to see if there's some similarities between where we think that we might have a good candidate region for growing biomass crops and where we think we have the resources for doing CCS, so geological, the right uh, technology, those types of things. Um, but uh, the overall idea is that if you reduce emissions from a coal plant, through CCS, you lead to near zero or maybe a 90%, 80% reduction in CO2 emissions. But if some of that uh, production also comes from biomass that was taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and you have a favorable energy balance from how you harvest it or, 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 or manage it in the field, then you would actually lead to less emissions in the atmosphere. So that's what makes it a carbon negative approach, potentially. So, over here, <laughs> I've heard that one of the advantages that, that biomass production could have in terms of carbon capture and sequestration is that rather than pumping CO2 underground, we could uh, potentially use some of the crop residue to produce biochar and then to sequester that in the soil. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to that, if you have any insight or opinions I, about it. I can't it, say much about biochar, to be honest, but, um, you know, if, if you can find out a way to make it work, to distribute that much char across the croplands or, or whatever, uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done there, though. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if anyone points to that as kind of a near-term, it's ready to go kind of thing, but it sure sounds compelling, and it has the same advantages as CCS. Um, it's just you know, which one could you get going first. And right now there's a pretty good amount of energy working on CCS. Um, I know there's a lot of people working hard on biochar too, though. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. All right, thank you.